Thank you. Can everyone hear me? No? Nice to know someone's drinking for the first time. Bit of a killer. I'd stick to the water. Now, it's a great pleasure to be here, thank you. And uh, there's nothing I enjoy more than going out on a dark night in London and having dinner with a group of people I've never met before. <laughs> well, that's Ron Davis' story, I'm glad <laughs> <laughs> And what's good enough for Ron is certainly good enough for me. Um, got to be careful with Ron Davis. Um, he gets very upset by these sort of jokes. He says that um, he has never judged anyone and he shouldn't be judged. It's not quite true, actually. Ron Davis was the man who said of Prince Charles that he was an adulterer and a deceiver, and therefore not fit to be king. <laughs> These were qualities unsuitable for a future king, though obviously not in an old queen. <laughs> <laughs> obviously, I have to be careful talking about Camilla Bowles. Uh, we had a slight problem on the last series of Have I Got News For You. There was a question about Camilla Parker Bowles' son, Tom, um, who'd been caught um, dealing in cocaine. Um, and uh, uh, the question came up, uh, who was this? And someone said, um, well, that was a bit of a shock. We all knew his mother was doing Charlie. <laughs> so as the organizers said, nothing cheap, please. Um, Yes, it's a pleasure to be here at an IT function. Um, I'm sorry I don't really know anything at all about your industry. Um, <laughs> as they said, <laughs> don't worry, you should see who's introducing you. <laughs> I did have a, a brief and um, it, uh, it was very informative and I gather a lot of people here are looking for larger partners. <laughs> Apparently Vanessa's free. <laughs> no, I know it's strategic partners to promote your business interests, like Chris Evans and Billy Piper. <laughs> um, I don't know anything about your industry, and you're nice a bit desperate, having, having booked me and said, can you just make it up? And I said, I can't make things up. I'm the editor of Prime Time. <laughs> Obviously, we at Private Eye take e-business seriously. <laughs> you may think it's a fairly Luddite operation. That's entirely untrue. Um, we had a slight problem when we described the internet as the internet um, for 10 years. But we did. We did have a rather successful website. Yes, we had a website. And it was sponsored um, by Microsoft. Absolutely true, very successful website. All went absolutely swimmingly until I put this cartoon on it of someone staring into a screen and saying, spell check doesn't recognise the word monopoly. <laughs> Funny that, it was the end of the sponsorship. <laughs> I was asked to talk about something I might know about tonight, and they said possibly politics. Um, so I said I'd have a go. Uh, I was fascinated to see a report in the Telegraph last week that said that school children are having problems distinguishing between God and Tony Blair. <laughs> Which is fair enough, because Tony has the same problem. <laughs> It's very interesting watching him recently. Uh, Tony Blair is against anyone going on strike. He's an admirer of Mrs Thatcher. He's keen on law and order. He hates Ken Livingstone. He hates the TUC. He wants to reintroduce selection for schools. He can't get his party to agree on Europe. And his cabinet's full of sleazy ministers. It's interesting. Tony Blair, PM, is an anagram of I'm Tory Plan B. <laughs> I'm still going to lose the next election. <laughs> it is, Nancy, I've just made that out. 
But if anyone says I look like Haig, I will sue. <laughs> <laughs> I'm rather keen on um, Haig appearing again. He's been very good for one industry, which is the joke industry, obviously. <laughs> um, the last election, he appointed Cecil Parkinson to be chairman of the party. It was incredibly kind of him. And then we could put pictures of Haig and Parkinson on the front cover of Prime Time, um, with uh, uh, Haig saying, I want to bring unity to the party, and Parkinson saying, good idea, she sounds like a goer. <laughs> If you're not going to talk sensibly about politics, can you talk about the city? There's some, um, some prominent city people here, a lot of investment um, could be there tonight. So, anything about the city? Um, I said I don't really know much about the city, and, and the bits I do know you can't make up. Um, we haven't had much luck with this uh, <clears throat> uh, in terms of making jokes. Uh, our last big scoop was the Bearings Bank collapsing, um, which uh, happened on a day when the Sunday Times uh, managed to run Bearings Bank collapsed um, on the front page. Huge front page story. Um, where does satire go? You know what they had? The first thing on their appointments page, the same day in the Sunday Times? Uh, wanted. Head of internal audit at Bearings Bank. <laughs> <laughs> the successful candidate must be prepared to travel abroad. <laughs> I actually rang Bearings that week, trying to contact someone there. Um, the head of their unit trusts, you know what his name is? Mr. Dick Turpin. <laughs> <laughs> I have to be fairly careful when I tell that story, because I once did it at a city dinner where Mr. Dick Turpin was there. <laughs> he was an ex-Gurka. <laughs> Slightly tricky moment. I hope there's uh, no one in the audience who I've mentioned so far who is um, a relative of anyone. I was once talking at a sick form at a school, and I went into my usual rant about Mohammed Al Fayed. And a rather stroppy sick form got up and said, Would it embarrass you to know that a relative of Mr. Fayed is actually in this room? I said, Doesn't embarrass me, I'm not related to him. <laughs> Um, anyway, you have, you have me as a speaker, and again, um, uh, you've got to be careful with speakers. The Telegraph ran a survey, which is rather daunting for those of us who do this sort of thing. Um, their research suggested that 30% of speakers are boring and repetitive, 28% go on too long, 30% are boring and repetitive, <laughs> and 28 apparently go on too long. Uh, the most depressing thing about it all um, was that the most popular speaker that um, functions like this still want is Geoffrey Archer, <laughs> which is rather tragic. Um, Geoffrey Archer um, has been a source of much amusement um, to us over the years. Geoffrey always wanted to be Dick Whittington. Halfway there. <laughs> Brian and I um, found um, Geoffrey's bid for London particularly funny. Um, because he used to get dressed up in these sort of pearly king outfits um, to go out and try and get votes. So we invented our own form of Geoffrey Archer rhyming slang. Fairly simple, apples and pears, dodgy shares. <laughs> Trouble and strife, prostitute. <laughs> you get the idea. Um, I'm sorry about that, that is the trouble with booking me live. On oh, Have I Got News For You, they tend to cut out um, the naughty bits. Um, I've had quite a lot of trouble over the years with, with some of the guests on that show. Um, there was an incident with a woman called Paula Yates, who was um, very unhappy and um, referred to me as a four-letter word, um, beginning with C-U. Cute. <laughs> Uh, no, it wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't, actually. Um, she stormed out, but luckily they cut a lot of that out, um, as they have to. One of the first shows um, uh, I was ever on, we had Cecil Parkinson on, which again, is, uh, Cecil was a great success, smiling, working the room, twinkly, lovable. And uh, the first question came up, was a picture of Mrs. Thatcher. I said, look, Cecil, there's your mistress. <laughs> that didn't go out. <laughs> The next series in what I think was an all-time career low, 
I found myself sitting next to Derek Hatton. <laughs> um, Hatton had just been found um, innocent by a jury of corruption. Rightly. <laughs> um, and uh, there he was on the show. And um, he'd done an advert for a watch, which he was uh, some stupid watch. He was incredibly pleased with himself. He kept flashing this watch. And I said, oh, that's nice, Derek. That tells you the time that you should be doing. <laughs> that didn't go out either. <laughs> Unfortunately, the one that did go out was also about a stupid watch. I don't know if you remember, there was a Tory MP called Michael Mates, um, who gave a silly watch to Azil Nadir, one of those pillars of financial probity um, that we're so good at in, in this country. Um, and he'd given him this watch, and the question came up, and I said, oh, Mates, Mates. That's a good name for a prick in a cover-up. <laughs> and sadly, that did go out. <laughs> I, um, I don't want to give the impression that the guests always have a bad time when I got news. Um, that would be unfair. Some guests genuinely surprise you. We had Neil Kinnock on um, after he lost the last election. And then he turned up, which was extraordinary, he turned up in his own clothes, no suits, very relaxed, very happy, smoking, um, and a question came up about a picture of Mrs. Thatcher that had been defaced in the House of Commons and then restored. And um, Kinnock leant back and he said, huh, first time Maggie's been touched up since Cecil left. <laughs> I thought, God, if you'd been that funny, I would have voted for you. <laughs> The, um, the most famous incident was one when we had both the Hamiltons on. Uh, two for the price of one. That's not just a bit of gossip, that is how they did the bargain. Um, <laughs> extraordinary, you couldn't get through them at all, actually. Hide the rhinoceros. Um, in the end, we actually sort of gave them brown envelopes uh, full of money to see if, if they got the idea. <laughs> no reaction. Um, I think they thought that as senior conservatives, the only thing you do with a brown envelope is give it to a prostitute on Victoria Railway Station. <laughs> um, I was told not to degenerate into cheapness. <laughs> <coughs> or to go on about my obsession with Geoffrey Archer. So, try and talk about something a business audience will be interested in. Export. Um, I haven't done a lot of export, but... I used to work for a programme called um, Spitting Image, and we did sell one episode of Spitting Image to America, to NBC. It was a very, very good export deal. And uh, we wrote the script, it's during the Reagan era, and um, the president of NBC called um, us into his office and he said, are you guys suggesting, are you suggesting the president of the United States is an asshole? <laughs> And we said, yeah, that's more or less the script. We were fired. It's a real shame, actually. I was rather proud of it. It's the one where um, the aide comes in and says, congratulations, Mr. President, it's your 75th birthday. And Reagan says, great, how old am I? <laughs> Those were the days. Reagan makes Bush look like Einstein. <laughs> um, if not export, then what about um, running your own business? Um, private eye, it's a business. Um, surely you must have something to offer. Well, um, yes. Uh, the men's magazine industry this year um, has had a very good year, I gather. Um, there have been 500% sales increases in the big magazines. That's loaded for him and Maxi. Private Eye has had a, a 0% um, sales increase this year, which is not quite so good. Um, and I have tried to copy what they're doing. I mean, I've put tips on the cover. Robin Cook, Peter Mandelson. <laughs> Just hasn't worked for me. Um, recruitment, they said. Everybody recruits. Recruitment. That must be something you can talk about. Certainly. Certainly. We have a fairly strict graduate policy um, at Private Eye. I apply golden rule. Um, science graduates always ask you why something works. 
Engineering graduates ask you how something works. Accountancy graduates ask you how much it costs to work. And arts graduates ask you, would you like fries with that? <laughs> say that because I am that arts <laughs> And yours is a numerate business which is obviously quite quite beyond any of us. Um, my numeracy skills are about on a level with those of Samantha Fox, um, the famous topless model who told the sun, I got ten pairs of trainers. That's one for every day of the week. <laughs> In fact my skills are about on a level with those of Stephen Byers. Uh, this is the Labour uh, Minister who, when he was Education Minister, rather famously was asked on radio, uh, what is eight times seven? And Byers replied, 54. Incredibly embarrassing. Senior Labour Minister asked, what is eight times seven? The answer is, it's too early to say, you can't possibly expect me to put a figure on it. <laughs> anyway, Byers in Education, then he went to the Treasury. <laughs> then trade. Anyway, recruitment. Uh, Organisers said, well, how did you get a job? At least we can start with some, some sort of experience. How did I get a job? Um, I was given a job by uh, the late Peter Cook, uh, the comedian, who uh, used to run and own Private Eye. And when I was a student, I interviewed um, Peter Cook. I took him to lunch. But unfortunately, I didn't realise that lunch with Peter Cook did not involve any food. <laughs> um, and being at uh, age 20, I thought this isn't a big problem. I can, I can uh, have a few drinks from Peter Cook. Two, four, six, eight martinis. And um, sadly, at the end of the, the meal, uh, my tape recorder hadn't worked. And I'd taken no notes. And I was also drunk. And Peter was so impressed by my professionalism <laughs> that he gave me a job <laughs> um, on private eye. And that was a fairly strict recruiting um, procedure, followed obviously by on the job training, where I sat in an office opposite Willie Ruston. He used to start every morning by saying, Where would we be without a sense of humour? Germany. <laughs> quite a long time on the job at Private Eye to get any sort of recognition. Um, Peter Cook used to throw um, occasional parties for the magazine, which were largely full of uh, members of the Rolling Stones standing by the bar. Um, and I spent one very early morning with Mrs. Ron Wood, who was a sort of fairly archetypal 60s blonde. Um, and we were standing by the bars, not a lot of vodka in between. And I was quite proud of myself, so I got this job on Private Eye. And she said, what do you do then? And I said, uh, I'm, at, uh, I'm, uh, I'm Private Eye. And she said, really? Because uh, we've had some pops nicked from our villa. <laughs> Put me in my place. Um, the organiser said, if you can't think of anything to talk about, please talk about something you know about. Which rather narrows the field for me. Um, journalism, possibly. Um, not been a particularly good year uh, for me, uh, this one, in terms of journalism. Um, I was accused by the Sun of being a Trotskyist. It's not bad for the Sun, that's uh, three symbols. <laughs> <laughs> and the New Musical Express described me, you're not going to believe this, as a spineless minor public school yuppie. Believe it! Minor public school. <laughs> Um, they said, please talk about what you know, know about. Um, so I said, all right, I'll talk about libel. Now. <laughs> I'm not talking unintentional libel here. No fun in that. Anyone can do that. <laughs> the FT recently ran a, a, a large photograph of Anne Willigan, and underneath it wrote, police unwilling to stop and search. <laughs> Anybody can do that, I mean the real thing. Um, now, defending libel, I will accept, it may be argued that I'm not particularly expert in this field. <laughs> My first week as editor of Private Eye, 
I lost £250,000 uh, to Robert Maxwell. Um, and uh, in a lot of jobs, if you lose £250,000 in your first week, you get sacked. But at Private Eye, this was taken as a terrific feather. <laughs> <laughs> I even got a joke on News at 10. I said I paid out a fact check to a fact check. <laughs> Quite an expensive joke, really. <laughs> Still, Maxwell, what a great sealer he was. <laughs> I got my last rip from Maxwell um, uh, the year he died, um, in uh, April. And um, Private Eye was absolutely typical of the sort of thing we get done for. Private Eye said he was stealing money from his own pension fund. Oh, oh dear. Anyway, we, we would have lost. Um, but fortunately, he um, he went on the board, and um, obviously it was a, a fairly memorable day for us. But it, it was a day that proves you can't make anything good up. Um, the truth is always better. Uh, Maxwell owned the Mirror at the time, and um, the editor was a man called Richard Scott. And Scott was dragged out onto News at Ten um, to talk about what had happened. And he was interviewed by Trevor McDonald, and Trevor McDonald said, uh, "Mr. Scott, how was Mr. Maxwell feeling?" And Stop said, Maxwell was in a very buoyant mood. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, um, I continued to have a lot of problems with libel during most of my time at Private Eye. Not just Maxwell. Um, I once lost um, £600,000 um, in an afternoon um, during the Sonia Sutcliffe case. Now, a lot of editors lose money in libel to pop stars and celebrities, footballers, people people like. I lost £600,000 to the wife of the Yorkshire Ripper. Pretty popular kind of guy. My own view of the case at the time was she'll never go to court. And that's the sort of expertise <laughs> I'm talking here. Um, it's expertise about on a level with that of American Express. Um, who sent me, I think, the worst bit of direct mail ever. Uh, shortly after that, it said, uh, Dear Mr. Hislop, why run the risk of having to pay expensive legal fees when we'll pay them for me? <laughs> so the American Express legal expenses plan is a highly effective way to protect yourself against the potential tripling cost of legal fees for £12.50 a month. <laughs> Um, I obviously had a problem with libel. I ended up uh, having a, a fairly fierce argument with my wife when my first child was born, a daughter. My wife wanted to call her Susan. Uh, I said, no, there's enough people running around London shouting, Sue Hislop, without <laughs> us adding to it. Um, I, I hope none of you come across this problem, but um, the main problem is a man called Peter Carter Ruck, um, who is London's top libel lawyer. Um, very senior figure, Peter, and um, obviously a man who we at Private Eye find enormously funny, because uh, his name rhymes. <laughs> well, it does. Um, and for some reason, whenever he's mentioned in Private Eye, instead of an R in his name, um, an F appears. And he's a fairly senior figure, Peter, and he said, you are pathetic. He rang me up and said, you are pathetic. I do not want to appear in your pathetic little magazine as Peter Carter. <laughs> I said, absolutely, Peter, it will not happen again. So the next issue, he appeared as Peter Farter Cuck. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, pretty grown-up stuff. At <laughs> uh, last year, um, I admit, was disappointing in terms of libel, um, Private Eye was meant to be in court against Jonathan Aitken. We had an absolutely cracking case coming up, and uh, we called him a liar. <laughs> <laughs> but unbelievably, The Guardian went to court first. And this shows you how much they know about libel. They won. <laughs> Incredibly bad form. <laughs> Aitken got sent down for perjury, which took all the fun out of it. I was particularly annoyed because I'd come up with a new strategy. 
quite often try that I end up apologising after a libel case. And I thought, with Aitken, I'd apologise first. Um, and I was quite proud of the apology um, we put in, if I could just share it with you. Um, I put this on page three. It said, uh, in our report on Mr. Aitken's involvement with a number of distinguished Arabian businessmen, an unfortunate typographical error was introduced. Thus the sentence read, Aitken tried to procure girls for the Arabs. They should, of course, have read drills. <laughs> a favourite snack for Middle Eastern dignitaries, and it was quite understandable for Mr. Aitken to provide grills for his friends at any time, day or night, in the privacy of their own sorghum. <laughs> Big grills, little grills, <laughs> Danish grills. <laughs> And of course, grills dressed up as French maids. <laughs> we regret any confusion caused by this misprint. Sadly, um, Aiken refused to accept that as an apology. Um, I'd, um, I'd hate to leave you with the impression that libel is the, is the most um, serious business of my job. It is more serious than that. Um, occasionally I have to deal with something called the D-Notice Committee, which deals with national security. Um, and just as a small story of how Britain works, uh, I don't know if you remember during the Gulf War, the um, entire plans for Operation Desert Storm, they were in the back of a Volvo, and someone parked them outside a showroom. And if you remember, it was nicked. Someone just nicked the car, so the entire plans for Desert Storm got it. I had a call from the Admiral, who runs the D-Notice Committee, this, this is how Britain works. And he said, is that Ian Hislop? I said, yeah. He said, you know those plans for Desert Storm? I said, yeah. He said, you haven't got them, old boy. <laughs> <laughs> That's a true story, and as ever with true stories, I can't top it. Thank you very much indeed. pulled out in the last minute. Thank you very much, Ian Islam. We really appreciate that. <laughs> so the, the fun continues in various guises, and for those of you who uh, stay up, don't forget to be here for Andrew Wilder, virginity or promiscuity. I bet that's what you're thinking, Ian, what we're doing tomorrow, at quarter to nine in this room. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your evening, ladies and gentlemen.